Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Gonzalez. I'm an assistant director at the Strauss Institute over at Pepperdine University School of Law. Um, I'd like to take opportunities when I'm in country to take a moment to meet with students and kind of share uh, information on the application process for LLM programs just to give you a little bit of background of myself. I've actually been with Pepperdine for over 12 years and so I've seen a number of applications that come through the system. So I always like to share a little bit of information regarding what the law, legal education is like in the United States, as well as tips for personal statement, letters of recommendation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just to mention a little bit, Pepperdine University is located in, in Los Angeles, uh, in the city of Malibu, California. Um, just to start a little bit on the presentation, to switch it over. So when it comes to understanding your options for legal education in the United States, there's actually a number of uh, dip different options available to you. Uh, in the United States, there's actually over 200 law schools. So when it comes to making a choice of where you want to go to school, there are a number of different choices. Law schools will typically sit within a university environment. So what that means is when you're uh, looking for universities, you will typically see uh, a university, for example, well, Pepperdine University has a graduate program as well as an undergraduate program of business, psychology, education, public policy, but then a law school. So typically you will see law schools that sit within a larger university environment. I think there are about two law schools that are independent law schools. Um, I think Brooklyn Law School is one of them and there's one more. Uh, there are approximately 141,000 law students in the United States, um, and it's evenly split between both male and female students. So when it comes to choosing the right school, again, you have a number of different choices available to you. Uh, one of the biggest elements I always recommend that applicants look at is levels of accreditation. So in the United States, there are two levels of accreditation for law schools. One is regional le level of accreditation, so you'll see in the map on the left hand side that there's California accredited, there's a Northeast, Northwest accredited, there's Midwest, there's a regional levels of accreditation. For international applicants looking at applying for law schools, the level of accreditation I always recommend is the ABA level of accreditation. This is the national level of accreditation. This means that the law school has met higher marks in regards to statistics, in regards to employment, in regards to uh, a variety of elements that, that will make it a lot easier for you as an applicant to sit for the bar if you're looking at doing so. It, it is more widely respected in regards to employment, whether in the U.S. or abroad. Um, and so I always recommend that applicants limit their search for law schools to ABA accredited institutions. One of the other elements I always recommend that applicants look at is thinking about why you're looking at going to law school, uh, whether it's in the U.S. or other locations. What do you want to do? Um, are you looking at practicing law in a particular area? Are you looking at working for a corporation or organization and working as a kind of legal consultant? Um, are you looking at working in the United States? Are you looking at working for an international law firm? Thinking about what you're hoping to do after uh, continuing your legal education in the United States will help dictate the type of degrees to ch that you should choose. Um, in the United States, there's a number of different degree options, which include the JD degree, um, the Master's of Law degree, as well as the Doctorate of Law, which is the SJD degree. Uh, by understanding what career you're looking for, where you're looking at working, and the type of work you're looking at doing that will help dictate if the JD program, the LLM program, um, is a better option or if you should continue into a doctor program. Uh, just to mention a little bit uh, about the JD program, the JD program is the first degree of law in the United States. So in many international locations, the first degree of law is an LLD or Bachelor of Law. In the United States, Students have to go through a bachelor's degree in any area, then at the graduate level start a three-year first degree of law. Uh, typically with the JD degree, uh, their students are taking general courses, the contracts, torts, criminal property, wills and trusts, et cetera, where they're building their uh, knowledge on US, uh, US law. 
And so with JD programs, you don't typically get concentrations or other areas of emphasis, but other law schools will provide uh, other options like certificates or other incentives uh, where you can get in complement to your JD degree. So that may be one element to consider that would differentiate one JD program for another. Uh, the second degree of law in the United States is the master's of law degree. So with an LLM degree, that is typically a one-year advanced legal program. Uh, I always describe LLM degrees in two different ways. Uh, for LLM programs, there are many LLM programs in the United States that will offer a general LLM. What this means is uh, schools have opened up their JD curriculum so that they could let international students come in and take a general, general a series of courses that they can kind of choose a la carte um, so that they could earn a, the advanced one year advanced law degree to qualify for a bar exam or to become more familiar with US law. The second type of LLM are specialized LLM programs. So with the first option, it's an LLM from XYZ University. With the specialized LLM, it's actually an LLM in environmental law, an LLM in intellectual property, an LLM in whatever the case may be. Um, with specialized law degrees, you're typically going to have a specific series of required courses as well as elective courses. Um, choosing between a specialized or a general LLM will vary depending on which topics you're looking at choosing. Um, in addition, if whether or not you're looking at sitting for one of the bar exams, one of the elements to think about is if your intent is to take courses required for the bar, the general LLM can certainly be helpful with that and will give you the most amount of flexibility in regards to your elective courses. Um, you can still take the courses required for a California or New York bar with a specialized LLM, but you'll want to be careful. I would suggest asking the programs you're interested in whether or not there are enough elective courses available to take the required courses to sit for one of the bar exams. Um, there are a number of specialized programs that do. So, for example, at Pepperdine, our LLM is in dispute resolution, so it's an example of a specialized program, but we have enough elective units that students can take courses required uh, for one of the bar exams. And then the lastly, the third degree uh, law degree available is that SJD degree. This is a doctorate of law. So for those of you looking at conducting research or becoming a faculty member, uh, this is the uh, highest level of a law degree in the United States. Uh, for SJD programs, there are a couple things to look out for. With SJD programs, they will require that you have an LLM degree. Uh, depending on the program, some SJD programs will recognize an international LLM, uh, but realistically, that's a smaller amount. Uh, many of the SJD programs in the United States will require that you have an LLM from the US. Um, and so looking at, if you're looking at being a researcher or teaching in a particular area of law, looking at that SJD program and what the requirements may become very important because you'll want to look and see what type of LLM they'll accept and from where, what institutions in what area. There are some L SJD programs that are fairly exclusive in the sense that they only want students that have received their LLM degree. So you want to be careful with some of those choices. With the SJD, again, it's a three to five year program where typically you, you're taking a series of required courses, but then you're paired up with a faculty member and you're doing research within the field, or maybe there could be a TA or um, a teaching component that may be required as part of that program, but it will vary program to program. With SJD programs, just to mention, the application process will differ. Uh, with JD and LLM programs, what I'm going to be mentioning uh, coming up regarding the application process, um, it's going to be a little bit different. With SJD programs, you need to contact the schools directly and apply directly through to the institutions for those SJDs um, because each program is going to have different uh, methods of applying, but it's usually through the through the university directly rather than through the law school admissions council or other service. One of the other elements I like to mention, especially in international formats, is I'm seeing law schools start with uh, creating these alternatives to the traditional uh, legal education. So again, in the United States, a law degree is considered the JD degree, the LLM degree, or the SJD. All three of those are considered in, in as a law degrees. But I'm seeing more and more law schools opening up their curriculum for those with backgrounds in human resources, in business, in counseling, and other non-law areas, so that they could take a master's in 
legal studies or uh, masters of studies in law or at Pepperdine we have the masters in dispute resolution. I, I always recommend that applicants be careful. The, these non-law degrees will cover the subject areas of law and it'll give you expertise in understanding, uh, in understanding law, but they are not law terminal degrees. So you will not qualify for the bar uh, and you're gonna have other issues. If you have a first degree of law in Mexico and you're eligible to practice law in Mexico, I always recommend that you limit yourself to a JD, SJD, or an LLM degree. But if you have a bachelor's degree in other non-law areas and want to have an understanding of US legal education, these are great options without having to go through and get a legal degree. So it, it won't make you eligible to practice law, but if you're working in that human resource department and see a lot of contracts, for example, and want to better understand them, these are good options. One of the biggest questions I get from applicants is choosing between doing a JD or an LLM degree. Um, one of the uh, biggest elements to take in consideration, and I always recommend applicants to think about that again, is thinking about where you're looking at working. So with the JD degree, if your intent or your goal is to work in the United States, the JD degree is gonna make you most competitive. Um, with an LLM, you can go through a one year of an advanced law program and qualify to sit for the bar. You can go through and pass the bar. But the challenge with an LLM degree and working in the United States is when you look at law firms and they have opening positions that are, you know, associate positions available at their law firm, they're going to compare someone with a JD degree and someone with an international law degree and an LLM degree, and they're going to look at the LLM candidate as being overqualified. Um, and so when it comes to being competitive in that job market, having that JD degree can certainly be helpful. Um, but when it comes to working in an international environment or working with an area of specialty, having the LLM is actually going to be of more value. So NYU did a study about two years ago where they uh, interviewed a series of international law firms and asked the law firms if they would like to have students that you know apply and interview with their organization to have passed one of the US bars. Um, and only 18% of the law firms had said that it would be nice. Um, realistically, they were looking for candidates that provided areas of specialty. So when they received cases that focused on intellectual property or environmental law or other areas of specialty, that they have a candidate that they can actually refer those cases to. So for them, having that LLM is going to be more competitive than having a US law degree or passing a US bar exam. Um, and so if your interest is working in an international law firm or an international format, getting a specialized LLM will be of uh, higher value than having, again, that JD degree. So again, I always re recommend that applicants take a step back and think about where you're looking at working. Um, now, applicants don't necessarily have to decide between the two. I'm also seeing a number of hybrid programs that are coming out where you can actually do a joint JD with an LLM or a sequential JD with an LLM. Um, and so at Pepperdine, we have a, actually an LLM to JD transfer program where applicants can, and be, can take the LLM and then towards the L, of the LLM, they can apply for the transfer. That means admission to the JD program will be based on your grades rather than having to take the LSAT exam. So looking for options like that can be fairly useful if you're looking at being able to get areas of specialty plus um, being able to move into a JD program. Um, there are a number of programs out there that will let you do um, them sequential. I'm seeing a number of accelerated JD programs as well where you can go through and earn the JD degree in two years instead of the traditional three-year program. Uh, what that typically means is you will probably start during the summers and go through and do the same amount of coursework but just in a concentrated period of time. So you're still making it's not more work that you just lose the summers so that you can uh, take the additional courses. I've seen some law schools in the United States that will actually give some um, applicants advanced standing if you're applying to a, a JD program and have already have an LLM or already have uh, advanced law standing. So you can look at some of those uh, options as well. So there are some combo options if you're looking at possibly leaving your opportunities available by having both the first degree of law, the JD, with the second degree of law, which is the LLM. When it comes to finding the right school, there's a number of different elements that you can consider. So for some people, location is important. So perhaps they, you want to find a location that's close to a metropolitan city with good public tr transportation. Perhaps you 
you know, really like an area that has the four seasons uh, where you can experience the, the summers, the snow of winter and, and the changing of leaves in the spring or where, whatever the case may be. Um, for some people, they may have family that lives near a certain region. So they're looking for um, a school that may be close to, close to family. Um, reputation is a biggest component uh, that people look, la look at. In the United States, they do have a ranking system called U.S. News and World Report. So for some people, they look at those rankings. I would just say be careful. Uh, U.S. News and World Report rankings are typically rankings that are, that are anchored in the statistics of JD programs. So if you're looking specifically for an SJD or for an LLM, uh, the rankings of a law school can be a little misleading. Uh, the part where it can be helpful is if you look at specialization rankings. So if you're looking for an LLM that specializes in a particular area, looking at the specialty ranking uh, for, the, for, for that particular area especially can be helpful. I think U.S. News and World Report uh, ranks about 10 to 12 areas of specialty. Um, dispute resolution is one of them, and, and we are the number one ranked program within that area of specialty. But I would, again, always recommend that applicants look beyond just U.S. News. Look at the faculty, look at the reputation, look at what they're doing in the field. Because looking at the faculty and whether or not they're well involved in the community, whether or not they're well published, can be certainly helpful when it looks at, when you're looking at finding opportunities to be a research assistant and working very closely with one of these star faculty members. Or looking at whether or not the university offers uh, cons uh, offers uh, conferences or symposiums or other opportunities for you to network within the field. Um, because what you get out of the school is only going to be as good as how involved you are with the school. Are you just attending courses or are you also attending the lunchtime sessions or the, the conferences or other elements where other opportunities for you to network with those in the field. Um, I also recommend looking at availability of clinical or externship programs. Um, that's one of the benefits of a U.S. legal education is the ability to have some of those practice elements. So at Pepperdine, we have, uh, as an example, a mediation clinic. So you can go through the courses and learn how to theoretically mediate the case and, you know, the stages and what you should be doing. But it's another thing when you're actually in the court and you are in the middle of two parties that are yelling at each other and you have to come in and kind of help them resolve the situation. You get to kind of take that theory and move it into instinct of being able to talk the parties through the conflict, being able to find a resolution. Um, so taking advantage of some of these clinical programs and externships can be very beneficial. To pass that mediation class, you need to have mediated 24 cases minimum. In some countries, that's actually an experienced mediator. So taking advantage of these clinical opportunities can be a very important tool of, of taking your education to the next level. And then I always recommend that applicants consider any other special characteristics. So for some people, you know, I was just talking with one of our current students who is from Argentina, who was very big into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So he really wanted to find a studio near the campus in the area where he can kind of delve back into that. And he's actually competing, I think, this weekend in San Diego. Um, and so finding elements that can be important in balancing this, this, the hard elements of going to law school with something that you enjoy doing can be very important. And I always recommend that applicants apply to a range of schools. Find some schools with areas that you're really interested in and, and areas where you know you have the right testing numbers, that you know that you can, the safe schools that you know that you'll have a good chance of getting into, as well as the far-reaching schools. Um, and I always recommend that applicants not limit themselves to the price tag. Realistically, education in the United States can really vary from uh, public institutions that are maybe state run that can be a little cheaper to private institutions that may have a higher price tag. But realistically, a lot of those private schools are giving higher scholarships. So when it comes to your out the door price, you may be able to get a bigger, a better deal on your education with a private school. But you actually won't know until you actually apply and receive your scholarship awards. Um, one other recommendation I typically make, and I probably shouldn't because it makes my job harder, is when you're applying to those range of schools and receive various scholarship offers, I'm, gonna, I'm a negotiation program, so I will make this suggestion. I always recommend that applicants use those scholarship offers as an opportunity to check with the schools regarding uh, what their options are. So let's say, for example, 
you're, you really wanted to get into your dream school, which is, you know, school A. That's a school you really wanted to, but school B gave you a higher scholarship offer. Don't be afraid to take that scholarship offer from school B to your dream school of school A and ask them if they're willing to match it. Realistically, two things can happen. Uh, one is they could say, sorry, we don't have the budget um, and we won't be able to match the scholarship. And you would then have to a decision to make. But the second option is the school actually matches the scholarship and you get your dream school with your dream scholarship. But realistically, it won't happen unless you actually try. Um, and I always recommend that applicants use the scholarship award letter as their method um, of being able to approach that conversation. Don't try to barter with the university. That's a little different. Um, but if you use the scholarship award letter as a concrete way of asking to see if they'll match, that's a, that's a little bit nicer approach than trying to negotiate on a scholarship, which is looked at a little bit more negative. Um, but don't be afraid to approach them with those other scholarship letters. When it comes to finding a school, there's a couple of different options available. Um, LSAC.org or the Law School Admissions Council is, is a big resource for students looking at legal education in the United States for both JD and LLM programs. What's nice about LSAC is they actually have a directory of ABA accredited programs. Um, that you can look through. And so with the directory, you can actually put in your parameters. I'm looking at, for a small, medium, large school in a particular area that focuses on, you know, you can put in your parameters of what you're looking at studying. Um, and LSAC will generate a list of schools that, that meet those areas of interest. And so with LSAC, it's also most likely to be up to date. LSAC actually sends universities uh, emails every year. So I receive an email typically during the summer asking us to update our information in the LSAC directory. So you're more likely to get uh, you're more likely to get up to date information through that directory. Another option is LLMGuide.com. Um, LLM Guide, you will have a variety of elements. They will have paid subscriptions from universities that will have higher will show up higher in the in the search engines as well as uh, unpaid, which are free listings. Um, so some of the universities or the results that come out can be skewed based on who's paid for a service. Um, LSAC is completely free to everybody, so everybody gets equal service. LLM Guide is good for more chatter. So if, let's say you gained admission to a program, but you're deciding between the various options, LLM Guide is good to be able to get feedback from uh, alumni that have gone through, students that have gone through, other people that, are, that have been through legal education in the United States, and get some perspective on how it's viewed, um, or, or to see previous conversations. Uh, there may have been people that have posted questions on things that, that are concerning to you. Um, so to look through old postings as well as post your own questions. Um, th that's a good option. Peterson's is another option for a directory. They do have a directory specific for LLM programs. I would just be careful. Um, I don't know how often they update their information. I can tell you that I've tried to update my information with Peterson's, and it, it still hasn't been updated yet. So just take it with a grain of salt. Um, I know at least with LSAC, with, with the emails that we get, that those are most likely up to date. Um, again, also look for ABA levels of accreditation. Um, one thing that will differ is what to expect in the classroom, depending, and this honestly will vary school to school. Um, there are some, there are basically two structures. If you're looking for a JD program, you're, you're typically going to have your average classroom of what, 70, 60 to 75 or 80 students within that classroom. Those classes are typically taught in Socratic method, which means that students are given um, reading assignments that are due before even the first day of class. And, and the faculty will actually call on students when it comes to um, how you're engaging in the classroom, there's no way to sit in the back of the classroom and just not be involved because faculty will call on you, you will need to be on, on your toes in regarding to response, responding to the questions and how you analyze the cases. Um, majority of the law schools across the nation teach using the Socratic method. Uh, what will also differ is with the Socratic method and, and the analysis of cases, it, many of the courses will be highly graded on final exams. So if you're taking those typical JD courses, you're going to you're going to be taking a final exam at the end of the semester, even perhaps a midterm exam in the middle of the semester. Um, and a good portion of your grade will be dependent on how well you do in that exam. Again, this varies program to program. At Pepperdine, we actually don't use the Socratic method. If you're going through the LLM program, our classes are only 
25 to 30 students. Um, because our focus is in learning the skills to negotiate, to mediate, to arbitrate, our classes are actually lectures, discussions, but a number of simulated exercises where you're put through scenarios and you figure out what your negotiation style, what happens when you put in a certain bid or change your increments this way or that way. So I always recommend that applicants contact the schools and check with them regarding how their classes are run, regarding how the grades are, are, are done. We don't even have exams for our LLM program. Students will actually submit research papers where they're applying the theory to an area that they're researching. So it's 15 to 20 pages. So check with the schools on how their grading systems are and whether or not um, some LLM programs in the United States will actually uh, grade the students on the same curve as the JD students if it's a combined class some will separate them out um, so that's another element to think about when it comes to going through that process realistically the administrators at law schools are fairly friendly um, so typically if, if you're visiting a campus I mean I normally will uh, schedule times where prospects can come in and actually sit in on a class to get a real sense of what it's like um, one of the element, other elements that, that applicants are really interested in, the qualifications and sitting for one of the bar exams. Um, realistically, the United States is different than a lot of other countries in the sense that, that we have multiple bar exams. In other countries, there may be one national bar exam. In the United States, we have bar exams for each of the different states. There are about 35 states in the United States that will recognize an international first degree of law and will allow you to sit for the bar exam as long as you meet some of the requirements. Uh, ncbx.org is a good website that will actually give you a list of what some of the requirements are. I can tell you two of the most popular bar exams for international um, candidates are the California and New York bar exam. Um, when it comes to uh, what, you're, what you need to do in order to sit for the bar exam, there are actually a number of different elements that uh, the bars look at. One is uh, making sure that your first degree of law uh, qualifies you to sit for a U.S. bar exam. So one of the elements I always recommend that applicants do, even while you're applying to LLM programs, if you know, if your intention is to sit for either the California or New York bar, I would always recommend that you submit your transcripts to be considered um, early on so that you know how you're to best use that LLM program. So by submitting your transcripts to the New York or California bar, they will actually review, review it and, and say that whether or not your first degree of law meets their requirement for, for legal education. And then they'll tell you, yes, you're, you, you meet the education requirements, but you still need to do your one year of advanced law training. Then you know that the LLM is the right direction. If you went to an alternative legal program and one of the bars does not recognize it, then you know that you're gonna have to, at that point, change directions and actually go through a JD program in order to qualify for that bar. So I always recommend that applicants get that done early so that you know how to best use that LLM uh, program because it would be it would be uh, a challenge for you to go through a full LLM degree and then to find out after the fact that the bar doesn't recognize your first degree of law and then you'd have to kind of start over and go through the JD to sit for the bar exam. So get that done early um, and so that you don't have so that you know concretely that what the steps you need to take to qualify for that bar exam. Um, typically, the bars will require that you have your first degree of law from your home country plus one year of advanced law training in the United States. Um, California and New York uh, will require that you're, you're taking 12 to 14 units of specific coursework on topics covered by the bar, so you want to make sure that you have that clear beforehand. Um, New York bar recently is changing uh, the requirements and moving from a New York bar to a multi-state bar exam, so we'll see how that changes, how they approve their courses. Um, but that's one thing that you'll want to consider is that to make sure that you have enough elective units to take that requisite coursework. For the California bar, if you've been practicing in Mexico for over five years, you can actually submit your credentials to the California bar to sit for the bar exam with, and may be able to do so without having to do uh, the one year advanced law training like through an LLM, but check with the California bar. Um, the bar exams will differ structurally uh, from each other. You have bar exams in the United States that are two-day exams while others that are three-day exams. And then a number of the bar exams will have additional components that are required. So California requires a moral professional responsibility exam, which is a half-day um, session, which covers uh, kind of an ethics component. The New York bar um, has required a character fitness or pro bono component where you're required to do pro bono work 
So looking at an LLM program that has those clinical or externships opportunities that will allow you to do the pro bono work as part of the LLM can be an added benefit. Um, for other schools that don't have clinical or externship options, students have had to do pro bono work after they've completed the LLM because it's required to do at the point of time that you're scored in. So some other elements to think about if your intent is sitting for one of these bar exams. When it comes to the application process, um, it's simply that, it's simply a process. It's going through and checking the boxes and getting the different components in. I always recommend that applicants apply early. Give yourself that time um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, for one, especially when you're looking at considering being considered for scholarship, um, by applying early, uh, many schools actually, I know at Pepperdine, we give larger scholarships the earlier you apply because realistically our, our funding for scholarship dollar budget um, is smaller later on. So if you're waiting to apply last minute, chances are that you, you will get a smaller scholarship, um, if any, because depending on what budget is available. Um, you want to make sure that you are looking at the application process with several months in advance, because there's a number of different components that will take some time when it comes to uh, taking a TOEFL exam. You want to make sure you leave yourself time to prepare for that exam so that you, once you take the test, you get the score you want, or if you don't, that you have time to improve on that. So make sure that you, you leave some time for that application process. I can tell you, taking a step back, applications for JD programs are typically for a fall starts, only fall starts. Uh, for LLM programs, you're going to have uh, students that will start in the fall, which can be, again, August or September timeframe in the United States. Um, but I'm seeing more and more LLM programs that will let students start in the year or in the spring semester, which can typically be uh, in the January term. Um, I would look at the application process based on when you're looking at starting for that semester. At Pepperdine, we actually also start students in the summer, um, which is at the end of May. So looking at when you're looking at starting your academic program and then working backwards from there with some of the application deadlines. So typically for those students that are looking to start in the fall semester, many of the law schools will have application deadlines, can have application deadlines as early as January. Um, and December, December, January, February. Those are going to be considered kind of earlier deadlines. A majority of applications will have March deadlines, or will still start accept, will still accept applications um, in April. I've only known like one or two programs that have a um, uh, publicized deadline as late as June. Um, but again, I always recommend that you apply early so you give yourself the most amount of opportunity to receive scholarship as part of that. Um, and then many applications, uh, as many schools will take applications on a rolling deadline, which means that the, that the school will review applications as they are uh, received. Um, so with rolling admissions, you want to make sure, again, you, you take the initiative to apply early so that you can get that early decision, but also have a better opportunity for scholarship. When it comes to the application components, the element that I always get the most amount of questions on is that mysterious personal statement. What should I address? What should I include? What are schools looking for when it comes to that personal statement? Um, I always recommend that applicants think about their application. Realistically, it is as an admissions officer, I'm going to receive your transcripts. So I'm already going to know what classes you took and how well you did in them. I'm also going to receive as part of your application a copy of your CV or resume. So I'm already going to know what you've been doing professionally within the field. So I always recommend applicants use the personal statement to fill the gaps, connect the dots between what you've been studying and what you've been doing professionally by giving us a sense of what your motivations are. What are your career aspirations? What do you want to do once you complete the LLM or JD or SJD program? So when it comes to talking about how you, for example, took that environmental law class in law school that really introduced a new field to you, which is why you then interned for this environmental law firm, which really piqued your interest, which is why you're now applying for this environmental law LLM program. Use what you've been doing and what we're seeing in your application to give us a sense of why you're looking at going through the program, what you're hoping to accomplish. Um, I always recommend that applicants take the time to actually make the personal statement specific to the institution that you're applying for. Realistically, the structure of your personal statement can be the same. 
in regards to why you want to be an attorney, what you're looking at accomplishing, what you're looking, what your motivations are studying in the United States. But take the time to actually look at the programs that you're applying for, look at the faculty, look at the course descriptions, look at the courses offered or the requirements to tweak that personal statement. So it seems that it's very specific uh, to the institution that you're applying for. Because realistically, when I'm reading a personal statement, I'm looking at whether or not the student is going to be a good fit. If you take the time to spell out how you as a student could be a good fit at my institution, that makes it easier for me to understand and see how you could be a good fit. Um, so when it, when it comes to those personal statements, take the time to adjust it for each particular school that you're applying for. With that being said, I always recommend that applicants also take the time to proofread and double check your work. Because realistically, I'll still receive a personal statement from applicants that say that how would be a, a really good fit for XYZ University that's not Pepperdine. You know, so it makes the decision easy for me, but it may not be the decision you're looking for. So you do want to make sure that you take the time to proofread and make sure that you're submitting the right statements to the right school. It's a simple thing, but make sure that you're double checking your work. Um, one of the other popular elements I see in a personal statement, which is not quite recommended, is applicants that try to make it too legal heavy. They're, they're using the personal statement as a method to show the university that they have uh, the abilities to do legal analysis. So they're using a lot of legalese within the personal statement. If you're not using the personal statement to tell us about your motivations, why you're looking at studying through the program, you've lost the whole purpose of the personal statement. It's called personal statement for a reason. It's for us to get a better understanding of who you are and what you're looking at accomplishing. If you want to be able to show us that you have the ability to do legal analysis, then some, some schools will actually accept a writing sample. So then submit that journal article or that I've actually received copies of books as part of the application from candidates. It's not required and certainly we don't read the book, um, but it's certainly helpful um, if you're looking at demonstrating. Uh, so just make sure you're, you're not having too much legal analysis because then you've lost the opportunity to tell us your story and tell us your motivation and why you're looking at studying within the institution. Um, the other, other element we want to prepare for is the application examination. So if you're looking at studying, especially from Mexico and you're looking at studying in the U.S., many institutions will require that you take an English proficiency exam. Most schools will accept the TOEFL. Um, as well as the IELTS exam. There are a couple other exams out there as well, but again, check with the institution you're applying for to see what programs they accept, because um, not all programs are accepted at all institutions. Depending on the program, um, some of the JD programs, because you're required to take the LSAT exam and the LSAT exam is offered in the medium of English, um, some JD programs don't require that you take a TOEFL or IELTS. So, for example, Pepperdine does not require because you're required a um, meet our marks in regards to the LSAT score. So uh, check with the institutions you're applying for. Because the LLM programs do not require the LSAT, uh, LLM programs will typically require English exams. So again, um, if you're applying for a JD program, the LSAT exam is required and perhaps not the English proficiency. If you're applying for an LLM program, the LSAT is not required. So don't sit through the LSAT exam. Um, but we will require some sort of English proficiency exam, as well as the SJD program. Because they're higher level of law degrees, um, both those programs will typically require a good grasp of the English language. Um, what I'm seeing more recently in the past couple years, I've been doing it personally for the last few years, is a number of academic programs are not just relying on an English test. Um, so for at Pepperdine, we've actually been doing Skype interviews in addition to a TOEFL or IELTS result. Um, as part of the admissions process. So don't be surprised if you apply to an academic program and you get a request for a Skype or telephone interview. Um, realistically, a lot of schools are realizing that a, a test is, may not be the best uh, method to, to determine English proficiency. Realistically, in a Skype conversation, I can know within minutes how fluent someone is within a conversation. Um, and with, within Skype, I can test both verbal as well as written language. Um, in real time. Um, and so it's becoming a more popular option within the application process. So don't be surprised if that happens once you're applying to law schools. Uh, letters of recommendation is another uh, component that I, I get a lot of questions on. With letters of recommendation, again, you can look at your application as a whole. Uh, letters of recommendation are, are another opportunity for us to get to know who you are and what your interests are 
um, but through the eyes of someone else. So with the letters of recommendation, I always recommend that applicants be strategic. Think about who, who you're looking at to at writing those recommendations and what story they're going to tell in regards to, are they going to give me a perspective of how you are in the classroom? Are they going to give me a perspective of how you work within an internship or work environment? Are they going to give me a perspective of how you've worked with past clients and what, what experience you've had within those different components? Um, I always recommend that applicants think about providing letters of recommendation that give us a well-rounded perspective of who you are and who your what your experiences are like, whether it's academic or professional. Again, this will vary depending on your particular experience. If you're a recent graduate, yes, I'm going to expect that most of your recommendations are coming from either internships or from um, faculty members from courses that you've taken. If you've been working in the field for several years, I'm going to expect recommendations from both academic or professional. If you've been out in the field for many years, then most of your recommendations are going to be professional in the field. One of the biggest mistakes that I see applicants do is they focus too much on titles. Um, they focus on giving me a recommendation from the president of the organization or from the dean of the law school. Um, I would always recommend that applicants be focused on the content. What are they telling? What are they sharing with us regarding who you are and what you're looking at doing? Because to get that letter of recommendation from that dean that just says, yes, this was a student at our law school and confirms that, that you attended the program, that's not as helpful as perhaps a recommendation from the assistant dean that also had supervised your thesis that can give us a deeper look of who you are and what you're looking at doing. So I always recommend that applicants be, again, driven by the content and not necessarily the titles. Yes, it's certainly helpful if, if you have um, a recommendation that, of someone that, that knows you very well um, and, and if they have a high title, then that's certainly fine. Um, if you know alumni that have gone through an organization, alumni uh, letters of recommendation can be very powerful, realistically, because alumni have been through the program. They know what it takes. They know the value of, of that degree. And so having someone that we know as, as an alum that is vouching for you can certainly be helpful. Um, and so be very strategic in thinking about who you're choosing for those letters of recommendation. And you will see two different formats. Some schools will actually require that um, that they complete an evaluation form or some 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 recommendation form. Uh, others will accept narrative letters of recommendation. So you do want to check um, with the schools to see how they accept those recommendations. The rec number of recommendations will vary from two to three. Some schools will be very specific. We want one academic and one professional from the field. So also look at the directions on the application to figure out which recommendations are required and what those what those requirements are. When it comes to the application process, I always recommend that you bookmark the Law School Admissions Council. Now, I mentioned this early because the Law School Admissions Council does offer that directory, but realistically, if you're applying for a JD program, all JD applications are run through this organization. So with the Law School Admissions Council, it's an organization that, that provides an avenue for applicants to submit their materials to, where you would submit your transcripts, your letters of recommendation, your uh, personal statement, all the different application components to LSAC, and then LSAC will then send it out to the different institutions that you're applying for. So there's a convenience factor. With JD programs, again, all applications are run through LSAC, so you will have to use LSAC to apply. For LLM programs, it will vary. With LLM programs, there are some schools that will only accept applications through LSAC. There are some schools that will make it optional to the applicant, um, and so I would look into those programs to figure out what those requirements are. What's convenient about LSAC is when you're applying to, for example, 10 different schools, instead of sending 10 sets of transcripts to different locations, and you can actually send one set to LSAC and then it will then send it out to the different schools. So it is very convenient. LSAC does charge a fee, so you do want to make sure that you budget accordingly um, to make sure that, that, that you keep that in consideration. Um, evaluation agencies is the last component that can delay an application. Realistically, um, depending on the schools that you're applying for, with international applicants, there are many institutions that require that you have your transcript evaluated. So what does that mean? Um, that means that you would send your transcripts to the organization. So LSAC is one of them. Um, it's very convenient because you just check a box. You're submitting transcripts to them anyways, and they just have it evaluated. 
um, while they're, they're processing your application. But an evaluation agency will give the institution or university um, an evaluation report regarding where you went to school, how well you did. Um, they will translate the grades to, in, a, in an avenue that is um, understood by the university. Um, with hundred with all the grading systems around the world, it's very difficult for an institution to be able to understand how the grades are in the different locations. So some universities will require that you have your transcript evaluated. Realistically, this process takes two to three weeks. So I always recommend that applicants um, that are applying to universities that require an evaluation that you start this process. This is the first thing you start. So while your transcripts are being evaluated, you can take that time to gather those letters of recommendation, to then write that personal statement, to pull all the other application components together so that after the two to three weeks and your transcripts are done being evaluated, evaluated, you can then submit the rest of your materials and it would be complete to the, and go to the institution that's ready to review. There are a number of different organizations out there that do evaluations, but I always urge you to check with the school that you're applying for to see which ones they will accept. Most law schools will accept LSAC evaluations. They do charge um, money for it, uh, and you will check their website to see what what their, those charges are. Um, but other institutions may accept some of the other, uh, other smaller agencies, but realistically, LSAC is specific to legal education. Um, so it's it's... It certainly is a more uniform method of evaluation, but check with the schools that you're applying to and see if they'll accept it, uh, other, other, other institutions. Um, but again, start this process early because it's one of the elements that can delay that application process. Sources of funding. So I always recommend, there's two different ways of thinking about sources of funding. I always describe it as internal sources of funding, which is from the institution itself. So at a university, you can, uh, you can be considered for scholarship at the point of application um, without any additional forms uh, needed, or some universities will actually require that you fill out a scholarship request or a scholarship form to be considered with application components. Some will actually have special endowed scholarships or sponsored scholarships that will have very specific instructions and very specific application deadlines. So you will want to check the school that you're applying for to see what their what those scholarships are. So as an example, at Pepperdine, we do partial scholarships at the point of admission. That means when you're applying for admission to the programs, uh, you are automatically considered for scholarship. And so with your uh, with your decision letter, it will say that you've congratulations, you've been admitted to the LM program with a XYZ scholarship. Um, our scholarships will actually vary from a couple thousand dollars up to 50% tuition uh, for the partial. And then we actually have several full tuition scholarships. So the full tuition scholarships actually have a specific deadline in early March where you're writing a two-page essay. Um, so make sure that you look at the program requirements and see if they have specific deadlines and if there are additional components that are required. Our scholarships are actually funded by three organizations, the Beijing Arbitration Commission, JAMS, which is a big international dispute resolution organization, and the Sig Mueller Law Firm. Um, and so these are organizations that have given money to Pepperdine to fund a student to study uh, at no cost um, other than their living expenses. So look and look at those opportunities. Um, for the JD programs, many scholarships are based on GPA as well as that LSAT score. So when it comes to taking the time to study for that LSAT, I always recommend that applicants take the extra time to make sure that you do well on that LSAT exam because realistically it not only dictates what school you'll attend, um, but it also will dictate whether or not you get a partial or full tuition. So for many schools, they provide partial funding based on it, the higher you get above the average. So for example, Pepperdine's average is 160. So the higher you get above 160, you can get a partial, which is a couple thousand dollars up to a full tuition with a stipend. Um, if you get, if you are able to get a really high score on that LSAT. So it does pay off if you take the time to do well on that LSAT exam. The second option for scholarships are actually external scholarships. So these are scholarships provided by outside organizations to help fund study in the United, in the U.S. So for example, here in Mexico, you have Funded and Conacyt and some of these government organizations and Fulbright that will provide scholarships to help study your study in the U.S. Um, if you're able to get some of these third-party scholarships, great. You've got other scholarship organizations. There's an example of all the different scholarships that are kind of out there. So a number of different organizations that provide funding 
Now, some of these will be government sponsored, some of these will be regionally sponsored, some of these are actually by topic area. So for example, there's actually a PEO International Peace Scholarship Fund for Women that's for anyone, but specifically in the area of conflict resolution. So look at the different requirements and look to see what type of scholarships are out there and what you can, can receive. If you're able to get, for example, the Rotary will offer scholarships that are partial, and if you can pair that up with a scholarship from the institution that you're applying for, that actually can can lead, can add up to the full cost of the program. Um, so don't just focus on just fully funded scholarships. Try to get partial scholarships that can possibly pay for a good portion of your legal education. Um, as I travel the world, I will actually list all these scholarships on our website. So you're welcome to visit this website um, and look for scholarship options. Realistically, I think of this as community service. So you don't have to be applying to Pepperdine to look at these scholarships. If someone's willing to pay for your education, then I will put that on the website just to be able to get the word out there um, for different scholarship opportunities. Um, just to mention a little bit about Pepperdine's program, um, again, I mentioned earlier, Pepperdine Law School is situated within Pepperdine University. So when it comes to um, joint degree programs, we have a number of options available because we have a School of Public Policy, a School of Business and Education Psychology program. Um, so with the JD program, there are a number of degrees granted um, as joint degree programs. We have, as I mentioned, the LLM to JD transfer program, and we also have a two-year accelerated JD program where you can go through the JD in that, those two years. Um, we have a number of institutes and programs uh, available within that, within your JD legal education. I specifically work with our program in dispute resolution. Um, so that focuses on negotiation, mediation, arbitration. So we offer a certificate in dispute resolution and a master's in dispute resolution. Those require a minimum of a bachelor's degree in any area. So when I talked about alternative legal education degrees, those are available for anyone with a um, non-law degree. So if your degree is in business or whatever the case may be, you can apply for either of those two. Um, but our LLM program is what we're most known for. Uh, our LLM program, again, is a specialty in dispute resolution, and we offer concentrations in mediation, arbitration, international commercial arbitration, litigation, international commercial law, and arbitration. And we also offer a general track. So for those looking at uh, being able to be selective on how they use their courses or sitting for one of those bar exams, they cannot declare a concentration. Uh, we realistically have over 52 different classes in dispute resolution so that you have a number of options and students in our LLM program actually have access to all the courses offered in the JD curriculum. So if you wanted to take that random bankruptcy class, you just talk to your advisor and they can get approval for that. Um, in regards to how we are known within the field, we are actually the top ranked program in the field of dispute resolution. We have been the number one ranked program for over 11 consecutive years. They've been ranking uh, dispute resolution programs for I think about 18 years now and we've been the number one ranked program for the majority of that. Um, I think we for about three years I think we were ranked number two. Um, but again don't just use rankings as your method of choosing a program. Uh, look at other elements in regards to reputation, faculty access, because um, those can certainly open additional doors in regards to what you can do professionally within after you've concluded your, your JD or your LLM program. Uh, in addition to our academic programs, we actually also offer a four-week program in July where students looking at studying LLM or studying law degrees can actually come to Los Angeles for four weeks and actually go through our U.S. Law and Legal Writing Seminar. So through this program, students from all around the world come in. Um, we actually have had attorneys come in that are not interested in doing an academic program but just want to spend four weeks getting an overview of U.S. Law and focusing on strengthening their legal research and writing skills. These summer programs can be very helpful if you're looking for a summer experience and maybe you're not quite ready to start one of the academic programs, or if you're about to start an LLM program, we've actually had a number of our LLM students participate in our summer program simply because it, it's been, it helps the transition of going back into an academic program. So with our particular program, you actually will have classes that will meet during the week and we have two field trips per week where students will visit the courts, they will visit GMs, they'll visit a number of uh, legal organizations in the Los Angeles area, and then Fridays is our social field trip where we take students to, you know, one of the baseball games or Hollywood Bowl or um, Universal Studios. So depending, these summer opportunities are a good op opportunity to get a taste of uh, an academic program without having to go through a full degree program, and there are a number of law schools across the nation that will offer summer programs. 
Um, Pepperdine specifically, um, realistically, I want you to find a school that best fits what you're looking at studying. If you're looking at studying a field in dispute resolution, then we are a good choice simply because that's our specialty. If you're looking at studying in bankruptcy or some other areas, you can certainly look at other schools that will offer you that option. We do have students that study in other areas and take advantage of being able to select JD courses. But again, it's finding the best fit for you and what you're looking at accomplishing and, and what type of education you're looking for. What I like about Pepperdine is if you look at that photo, Professor Jet Co is one of the world renowned um, specialists in the field of international commercial arbitration. He's actually working on the restatement. So he's really well known internationally regarding his research. But the fact that he is sitting on the table in the front of the classroom, talking with the students, just is an illustration of how accessible faculty members are. The fact that you can become a research assistant to some of these very well-known researchers is a unique opportunity. Um, what I like about Pepperdine is we actually will host barbecues. Uh, our directors will open up their home and invite all of our current students, all of our alumni and faculty members to come in at the beginning of the semester in the fall just to welcome their, all the new students coming into the program. So when it comes to choosing the right program, I would look at areas of specialty, I would look at the environment, I would look at how accessible not just the faculty are, but the staff members. When you're going through and you are having issues or you're having problems registering, how friendly are the staff members that can help you fix some of those issues or how accessible are they? Um, and so I would talk with the people that work at the different institutions um, and find out you know, those elements that could be a good fit. So at Pepperdine, we've got students right now, uh, I don't have a photo up, but we have uh, 44 international students in our LLM program from 29 countries around the world. You know, for our particular program, we're fairly diverse in regards to coming into environment and meeting and learning from all the all the practitioners from around around the world. What's unique about our program is because we have both domestic and international students studying together, we have attorneys that are practicing law in Alabama, Texas, Tennessee, that are also coming in and taking the exact same courses. You get the opportunity to learn uh, from practitioners that are within the field in the United States as well as internationally. Um, and so you really get a deeper knowledge of regarding how mediation or negotiation is used in various environments. But again, it's finding the best program for you. Um, if you want to learn more, you're welcome to use this QR code. It will take you automatically to um, a form that's on our website where you can put in more information and I can send you an email with, with additional links or brochures. I do want to make sure I do leave it open for questions. Um, I do have my direct contact details on the, on the screen right now. So uh, if you would like to contact me directly, I am accessible via email Skype. I just recently started a Twitter account, but um, you're welcome to follow that as well. But I do want to make sure I open it up for questions. So in this model, are the questions coming up on the screen? Or? Yeah. Okay. So if you have any questions about legal education, choosing the right program, getting funding, scholarship, um, let me know and I'm happy to address those questions. If you uh, are viewing this at a later point and not during the live session, you again are welcome to contact me with questions on the program. Um, there's a lot of information uh, that was provided in the presentation, so I'm sure it takes time to actually go through and digest and figure out which program is right for you. Um, but certainly you're welcome to use the uh, presentation as a reference to go back on and figuring out what the different requirements are. Um, again, I would always recommend that applicants reach out to the universities directly. Um, if you're looking at applying uh, to schools in the U.S., we are fairly friendly. If Mexico is not that far from the United States, so if you wanted to visit and do a tour and figure out which schools are the best fit for you, many schools will actually schedule times for you to come in, get a tour of the law school, meet with an admissions representative. Um, we at Pepperdine will let you sit in on a class. So you can get a real-time sense of what the classes are like. So don't be afraid to reach out to those programs and see and really get a sense of what those schools are like and how those programs are run. So um, it, please let me know if you have any other any additional questions, but I'm happy to serve as a resource for those of you that are looking at studying legal education in the US. Realistically, the fact that you're watching this webinar um, really talks about the important step you're, that you're taking to study abroad. And, Studying abroad will honestly change your life. It will change your perspective. It will change how you can impact the legal field 
in general and will take you honestly to the next level when it comes to your professional career. Um, and taking, you know, listening to this webinar is the first step of being able to take that exciting new step within your education journey. And thinking about studying in the US is a big step and it, it will certainly help you. And there's a variety of different options available to you. Um, good luck in your search and I wish you the best as you uh, continue, continue your legal education in the United States.